So I'm now going to show you something quite nice about limit points. So to illustrate this, I've got this example here, which is the sequence 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, etc. And it continues on like so. So this sequence has the three limit points, 1, 2, and 3. So you can take the subsequence where you have all 1s, and clearly that converges to 1. You can take the subsequence of all 2s, and clearly that converges to 2. And you can take the subsequence of all 3s, and clearly that converges to 3. So these three points are clearly limit points. The question now is, is anything else a limit point? Now, hopefully it should be obvious to you that nothing else can be a limit point. Now, this is a reasonably simple example. Um, you can see that all the points of the sequence are on these three points, so how can it possibly be accumulating anywhere else? The question is, how do you prove it? And how do you prove it also in more complicated cases? Because there is a beautiful argument here for how you can easily prove that no other number apart from 1, 2, and 3 is a limit point for this sequence. And it generalizes to much more complicated examples because I could dream up far more complicated sequences than this that have these three points still as their same limit points. So I could have uh, a, a subsequence converging to 1, a subsequence converging to 2, a subsequence converging to 3 that aren't just these constant sequence sequences that we've got here, and then combine them all together to make an overall sequence that isn't convergent to a single limit, but has these three limit points. And there, it's then more difficult to understand how to immediately see that there cannot be another limit point apart from one, two, and three. But there's a beautiful argument for how you can prove it, and that's what we're going to go over now. So the key thing here is that these three subsequences that converge to these three different limit points, they overall, we say, partition the whole sequence. So I've written them out here. So here is the subsequence of all ones, and uh, a way that you would write that is as so. If we call this sequence the sequence A sub N, then the this subsequence would be A 3k minus 2. So if you let k equal 1 here, you get 3 times 1 minus 2. So a1 would be the first term of this subsequence. Then the second term would be k equals 2. So you'd put 2 in here. So you'd get uh, 3 times 2, which is 6 minus 2. So you'd get a4, which is this term here. So again, it would be a 1. And then the third term would be k is equal to 3. So you'd put in 3 here. So you'd get 9 minus 2, which is 7. And then that's the seventh term. So you're overall getting get all of these terms from the original sequence, which are uh, one in positions that are 1 mod 3, and that's how you would uh, write that out. So that's that subsequence of all 1s. Then the red subsequence, the subsequence of all 2s, that would be a 3k minus 1 now, uh, and this will get everything that is in a position that is 2 modulo 3. So when k is equal to 1 here, you get 3 minus 1, which is 2. So a2 would be the first term here, which is a 2. And then when k is equal to 2, you get 6 minus 1, which is 5. So a5 would be in here, which is this 2 here. And then so on, you'd get a8 as your third term, and then a11 as your fourth term, etc., which are all these 2s. And then finally, the subsequence of all 3s, that would be a3k. Uh, all the things that are 0 mod 3. Uh, so k is equal to 1 here, you'd get uh, a3. k is equal to 2, you'd get a6, a9, a12, etc. So these three subsequences overall, they cover, they partition the whole sequence. So there is no term in this sequence that isn't accounted for by these subsequences. You can see that if you put them all together, it makes the entire sequence, there's nothing left out. If I got rid of this one, this orange one, and just had these two subsequences, they would not partition this sequence because all of these things in orange would be left out. So this is crucial that you need to take your original sequence, you need to find these subsequences that partition it, and then if you look at these subsequences and look at what their limits are, those 
that collection of limits, that is your collection of limit points. If you have this situation, then you can easily prove that there are no more limit points in that case. I'm going to show you how. So here's the theorem then in full generality. Let's say we have a sequence, a n, and let's say we have a bunch of subsequences of this sequence, and we're going to have m subsequences, where m is some finite value. So now, in this example, m was free, but because we're going more general now, we might have a general m number of subsequences here. So this is how I'm denoting these subsequences. So a m1 of k. So this is a function here of k. k is a natural number. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4. They are the kth terms of the subsequence. And for the val each value of k, it will spit out another natural number, and then that will tell you which term of the original sequence is in that kth term of the subsequence. So remember back to the formal definition of a subsequence. These functions, n1, n2, all the way up to nm, they are going to be functions from the natural numbers into the natural numbers. It's obvious that they're going from the natural numbers because k, remember, is going over all the natural numbers because it's the terms of the sequence. So the subsequence has a first term, a second term, a third term. That's what this k is denoting. And then it's going into the natural numbers because it's going to tell you what term you want from the original sequence. And it needs to be a strictly increasing function. So if you look at what ni, and I've just denoted this i because it applies to all of them. So i could be 1, 2, 3, any of them. It needs to hold true for all of them. They need to be strictly increasing functions. So ni at k plus 1 needs to be strictly greater than ni at k. Uh, and that needs to hold true for all k is an element of the natural numbers. So these are subsequences then, and we're going to say that they are all convergent subsequences. So this subsequence here is converging to, let's say, a limit, and we'll call it L1. This one is converging to a limit, and we'll call it L2. And this one is converging to a limit, and we'll call it Lm. And these subsequences overall partition the whole sequence. So if you look, if you put all of the terms from all of these sequences together, you get all of the terms in the original sequence. Another way of writing that is that if you look at the image of these functions, so think about this, the image of these functions give you all the terms in the original sequence that are going to be in this subsequence. So it means go over the whole of the domain here, which is the whole of the natural numbers, and work out all of the natural numbers that you're going to get out of this function by putting all the natural numbers in here. That's what I mean by the image. So we've got image of ni. So image of m1 would be the image of this one. It would be all the terms from the original sequence that appear, or the numbers of the terms from the original sequence that appear in this subsequence. And then if you look at the images for all of these functions, m1, n2, all the way up to nm, and you union all of those together, you have to get the whole natural numbers back again. So every single one of the terms of this sequence must appear in at least one of these subsequences, so that the entire sequence is covered by these subsequences. So if this sort of situation arises, then you can conclude that this set of points, L1, L2, all the way up to Lm, they are all of the limit points of your sequence and nothing else can be a limit point. And I'm going to show you the argument for that. And that's exactly uh, what we've got here. We've got these three subsequences that overall partition cover the entire sequence. They've all got limits. This is what L1, if you like, is one. L2, if you like, is two. L3 is three. And those, that set, one, two, three, that is the set of limit points for the original sequence. And also, this is quite helpful. Um, it shows us examples of what these functions would be. So m1 of k would be 3k minus 1 as a function. That's a strictly increasing function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. n2 of k would be 3k minus 1. And n3 of k would be 3k, all strictly increasing functions of the natural numbers. 
So to help you understand this abstract stuff even more, I've written this down here. So n1 of k is this function 3k minus 2, n2 of k is this function 3k minus 1, and n3 of k is equal to 3k in our concrete example here. And then just to explain this in this concrete example case, the image of this function n1, that's all things that you get onto in this map. So you go over the entire natural numbers and you map every single one of them according to this map. And what do you get? So if you start with 1, you put 1 in here and you get 3 minus 2, which is 1. Then you go to 2, you put 2 in here, you get 3 times 2 minus 2, which is 4. And then 3 in here, you get 9 minus 2, which is 7. So you, again, you get all of these terms, remember. So you get all of these numbers that are 1 modulo um, 3. So 1, 4, 7, 10, and then it will continue on, 13, 16, just keep adding 3. All of those would appear in the image of this function m1. Similarly for n2, its image would be all of the numbers that are 2 modulo 3. So 2, 5, 8, 11. And the image of m3 would be all the things that are 0 mod 3. So 3, 6, 9. All the natural numbers not including 0, of course. So uh, we start at 3. 3, 6, 9, um, 12, etc. And you can see then what I've written here, that these subsequences partitioning the overall sequence is equivalent to then the fact that if you union these three sets together, you get the whole of the natural numbers. Uh, it's saying basically that every single one of the terms of the original sequence is going to be included somewhere in one of these subsequences. That's all this is. Uh, it's just the abstract, more general way of writing down these intuitive concepts. So back to our general setup then. So clearly all of these points are limit points for the original sequence because we have these subsequences of the original sequence that converge to them. So that's the definition of being a limit point. What we now want to prove is that nothing else can be a limit point if it is the case that these subsequences partition the original sequence. The way we're going to do this is by contradiction, so we're going to suppose, for the sake of a contradiction, that there were another limit point that is not one of these ones, and we're going to show that that can't be the case. So suppose, for the sake of contradiction, that there is a point that we'll call L, which is not equal to L1, it's not equal to L2, it's not equal to L3, all the way on, it's not equal to Lm, it's not equal to any of these known limit points. We're now going to show that there's a problem here, and this picture nicely illustrates how there's going to be a problem. So I've got the other known limit points of our sequence drawn on here. Here's L1, here's L2, here's L3. I haven't drawn them all. It goes on. And then I've got this value L here, and what I know is that it is not any of these, so it is separate on this picture from all of these known limit points. Here is the gist of why this doesn't work. We know that these subsequences are converging to these values, so they are all getting and staying indefinitely close to these points. So after some amount of time in the whole sequence, it must be the case that all the terms in the sequence are very, very close to these points here, and that's why they can't be very, very close to this point, because they have to be very close to one of these. That's the basic overall idea, but we need to go into that in more detail. So we are going to basically find an epsilon that is going to break this point's hopes and dreams of being a limit point. We're going to find an epsilon interval uh, around this point L, such that after a while, for a tail end of the original sequence, if you go far enough in the sequence, there is a term and such that it and all the terms afterwards are not inside that epsilon interval. And the reason we're going to know they're not inside there is because they have to be instead inside epsilon intervals around one of these known limit points. So the question is now, what epsilon are we going to pick? And I would really encourage you to try and figure this out for yourself. So what we want to do is put pick an epsilon so that we can put little epsilon intervals around this point L 
around this point L1, around this point L2, L3, all the way up to L4, L5, Lm, and we want those epsilon intervals not to overlap, because crucially, we want to be able to say that at some point in the sequence, all the terms of the sequence are going to be inside the epsilon intervals around the known limit points, and therefore cannot be inside the epsilon interval around L. So that's why it's crucial that the epsilon intervals don't overlap, because if they did overlap, if the epsilon interval around L overlapped with one of the epsilon intervals around, say, L2, that would be a problem, because us now knowing that the points are inside that epsilon interval around L2 doesn't give us any information to say that they're not in the epsilon interval around L. So we want to pick an epsilon that is small enough so that they're not going to overlap. How are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to have to do is look at whichever one of these known limit points is closest to L, and then we're going to have to pick an epsilon that is half of that smallest distance. So on this picture, the one that is closest is L2. So we'd want to look at what that distance between L and L2 is, half it, and then if we picked epsilon to be equal to that, then we'd have an epsilon interval around here and an epsilon interval around here, and they wouldn't include that middle point because they're open intervals, so therefore they wouldn't overlap, so that would be perfect. So how are we going to generalise that? Because we don't necessarily know which one is closest to L, do we? This is the picture, but it might not have been that case. So how are we going to generalise that? Well, we just need to look at the distance from your point L to all of the known limit points, and then just take the minimum of those. So this then is what you need to do. You need to look at the minimum of the mod of L minus L1, mod of L minus L2, all the way up to mod of L minus Lm. So this, just to make it clear, this is this distance here, this one is this distance here, we haven't written it out, but mod of L minus L3 would be this distance here, and so on. You're looking at the distance between this point, this proposed limit point, and all of the known limit points. And then you look at those values, they're all non-zero because L is not equal to any of these known limit points. So they're all positive values, and you've got finitely many of them, M of them, so you can go through them and find whichever one is the minimum. Find that value, and in this case it's going to be this distance here, and then we're going to take half of that and use it as our epsilon value. So that's what I've written here. I've made epsilon equal to a half of whatever this value is. And here's the genius now. I'm going to put epsilon open intervals around all of my known limit points and this proposed limit point L. And what I can say is that this epsilon interval around the proposed limit point L does not overlap with any of these epsilon intervals around the other limit points because of the fact that I have done it in this way. It is equal to half the minimum distance between this point and all of the other points. So one of these points is closest in this picture L2. The epsilon interval around L is not going to overlap with its epsilon interval because of the fact that epsilon is equal to half of that distance between the two. And then for all of the other points, they are further away, therefore absolutely their epsilon intervals are not going to overlap with the epsilon interval around L. So why is this so crucial? Because now what I'm going to say is if I go far enough along in my sequence, all of the terms of the sequence are going to be inside these epsilon intervals around the known limit points, and therefore they cannot be inside the epsilon interval around this proposed limit point L, and hence there cannot be a subsequence that converges to this value L, and hence it cannot be a limit point.